<laughs> no, when we look at the biggest losers from the 2023 NFL draft, whether it's rookies coming in or players that have been replaced or potentially being replaced down the road, there's going to be a lot of transitions here going on through a lot of these teams throughout this whole offseason. Major, when you look at this draft that just came and gone, and you look at some of these depth charts across the league. By the way, if you want to check out my heat check there, I mean, all the IDP, all the offense, all the individual teams, it's all right there on one fancy little booklet, one fancy spreadsheet there, one easy to read. I like things simple. That's how I like to roll. But, Major, when you look at this, who is your biggest loser from the 2023 NFL draft? <sighs> I got to go to receiver. I'm going to go with Jackson, Smith, Nick Jigba. He was like slated as the number one receiver in this draft. Um, and essentially he goes to a team that he's the third receiver on now on a run first offense. So I don't know if he's going to have that target share. Like um, just in my head, I was thinking he's going to have like a Chris Olave type of rookie season. If he got an opportunity to go to a team where he can, you know, maybe not be the one starting off, but maybe eventually getting there like throughout the season. But um, Tyler Lockett to me is one of the most underrated receivers in all of football. I think he is the number one receiver on that team. People like to get, give that to DK, but I think Tyler is that guy that they go to when they really need to play. Uh, and then you got DK Metcalf, who's just like a monster out there. He's one uh, like a receiver, size, speed, all that stuff we've never seen before. And then you have Jackson coming out of the the slot there. Uh, Gino had a great season. I hope he continues his success. Um, Pete does like to pass the ball. He would not pass the ball all game if you really allowed it. So he's going to run that thing a million times, especially with that young running back, Walker. And then they went and got Zach. Uh, so, um, so I think I don't know. I don't see him having the target share that he's going to need to be in this class. Um, although I do like his skill set and everything else, I just wish he went to a better situation where he was maybe the wide receiver two or maybe even a wide receiver one. I think the biggest thing I could take from that is the synchronized head nods and Head shrugs from me and Tara. You nailed it with the Tyler Lockett. I think we're all in agreement. Tyler Lockett is criminally underrated. Then you kind of got me and Tara kind of go give the old little head shrug there when you said that he's probably better than DK Metcalf. So we'll give we'll give you a partial marks on that because you had us and then you kind of lost us. But we know what you're saying here. I get it. But you look at this Seattle team and these pass catchers here, and this kind of feeds into one of my biggest losers, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But you got Smith and Jigba there. You've got Tyler Lockett. You got DK Metcalf. You got Noah Fant still there. So there's a lot of pass catchers that are going to be involved in this offense. Terry, when you look at Smith and Jigba, what is the one thing that you're worried about in this offense for him? What are you worried about? It's just volume. Again, you know, this was a I I don't hate this pick for Seattle um, right. because they got good value. Um, in terms of where they drafted him and you can see what they want to do. Um, so, you know, it, it, Tyler Lockett, he's 30 years old um, and Jackson Smith and Jigba profiles very well to fill that role, but it's not right now. So right. You know, I, I logically, I see where they were going. I, I, I see where they were going with this. It's just not best for us from a fantasy perspective. No, I think we're all in agreement there. I mean, we like this pick for Seattle because after those big three pass catchers, it's down to Cody Thompson, Derek Young, D. Eskridge. By the way, I love D. Eskridge out of Western yeah. Michigan. But it, it does – there is a considerable drop between that first wave of what pass catchers and that second wave of pass catchers. So it's not that Miss Smith and Jigla is going to be a bad player. For, or even for fantasy, I don't think he's going to be a bad player. It's just I think his value was a lot higher entering the draft than it was coming out. Now, it's not going to say in two, three years, he may take that throne as the best receiver. We've heard Garrett Wilson already sing his praise about how Smith and Jigba was the best pass catcher there at Ohio State. Now Marvin Harrison's there. I mean, that's probably changed again. But mm -hmm. you look at how talented Smith and Jigba is, he's going to get his. It just might not be in 2023. Now, Tara, give me another loser here when you look at the – post-draft breakdown. And this will hurt some truthers, but it is Khalil Herbert and Donta Foreman. And I know right off the bat, people will say, what, well, you know, how can the, the fourth round draft capital of uh, Rashawn Johnson really affect the backfield that much? Well, there's a very specific reason. First of all, 
the path to upside was already shaky at best <laughs> for running backs in this offense. Mm -hmm. These are not guys who legitimately have RB1 upside because one, you know, Khalil Herbert, Dante Foreman profile very similarly. These are big early down bruising running backs, um, you know, goal line backs. If you've got two guys that are, you know, you're going with a thunder and thunder approach combined with a thunder approach of, you know, Justin Fields, that's a lot of workload to share. It's an aggressive run offense, but there's so much being taken up from the quarterback position that, you know, there's just limited upside and neither one of them are pass catchers. So that's a big problem here. You know, Khalil Herbert, terrible in pass protection. The bears have blatantly shown that they do not trust him. When you, when you look at the fact that I think we can all admit that, well, I, I like David Montgomery. I like him in his new position in Detroit. That was a great landing spot for him, all things considered, and the lack of openings in the uh, NFL in general. But I think we can all admit that when you're looking at the more explosive back, the one that was giving you more you know, bang for your buck on the ground, it was Khalil Herbert last year compared to David Montgomery and the year before, really. So you got to sit there and process you know, if that was the case and you've got one that is clear, visible, you know, more effective on the ground, why did they continue to roll out David Montgomery the way that they did? Because they wanted to go with the more well-rounded back and they just cannot trust Khalil Herbert on third down and in pass protection. And if you don't have it at this point, you've been in the league multiple years, you're not going to have it, unfortunately. So he has zero receiving upside at this point. And I don't think that Foreman is... Terrible. You know, there's not evidence of him just being awful in pass protection. That's just not his specialty. And that's just not the way that he's utilized. So unfortunately, you've got two guys um, splitting early down and goal line work combined with Justin Fields, no passing upside. Um, it's just a bad recipe for getting you, you know, five point fantasy games. And you're, you know, looking and hoping you can scrape together a touchdown. And when it doesn't happen, it's just a bad situation. Um, we saw it last year with Khalil Herbert, you know, he'd have, you know, a fantastic performance, 150 yards, multiple touchdowns, and, you know, it doesn't show up again for, you know, a couple months, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, same deal with Foreman as well. Uh, you know, we saw him thrive in good situations where he was playing bad run defenses, but when you don't have that upside of facing a bad run defense, he's very limited and terrible performances. Um, and that's where, you know, they're big losers because Rashawn Johnson comes here and solves the problem that neither of them can do. He is an excellent pass blocker. Um, Chicago has already spoken on it, that that's, you know, a massive upside that they see in him. He's proven in that. Um, and he's very capable on early down work great hands. He's a very well, well-rounded back. So, you know, unfortunately for them, you've got a guy who comes in here and he can do it all. So even if you see Khalil Herbert being the more effective runner, I can see where Rashawn Johnson comes in and throws a wrench into all of this because he's going to, in my opinion, it's not going to be hard for him to pass over Travis Homer in the depth chart. So I see him realistically having a very specific third down role in this offense right off the bat. That's huge. You get on the field, you're able to prove yourself. They're not going to waste you simply on that. You're going to get other opportunities. This could become a really bad situation where Rashawn is taking snaps from these guys and maybe it's a nasty three-headed committee. It's a big loser for them. And then maybe they like him so much, they give him a heftier share of the workload and lean him towards that kind of David Montgomery role. And he's probably going to be more effective in it. So I just don't think this is a good situation for them, unfortunately. So sorry, Khalil Herbert and Don to Foreman. Not looking good for you. <laughs> this one kind of hurts. I really wanted to see Foreman in this offense because we saw him do what he did there in Carolina. We, and we've seen glimpses of Khalil Herbert. But you're right. You got Rashawn Johnson, who is a north and south type runner. He's going to endear himself to the fans of Chicago with his style. He is a ground and pound. I want to drive it right between the tackles, and I'm going to run someone over along the way. The dude was averaging four and a half yards per carry his last two seasons there at Texas. And the only reason that we're not talking about him is because some guy named Bijan Robinson, <laughs> whose name will probably come up later on in the show somewhere along the way. But you look at the Chicago offense, they could be running a lot of two tight end sets here, right? They got Cole Komet, they've got Robert Tunyon, they've got a couple of capable wide receivers there, Darnell Mooney, DJ Moore. But if you're running a two tight end set, that means you want a running back that's going to be able to pound it in there and also protect it from time to time. And like you said, that's probably going to give Rashawn Johnson 
his ability to get on the field. Now, Major, when you look at these three running backs, who's your top back of these three? No, I was, just, I was going to put him as one of my biggest winners because I think he has – a fast track to be the starting running back skill set wise. I think he's better than both Herbert and Foreman, even though I do like Foreman. Uh, I, I was coming around on Herbert a little bit, but I, I just, I don't like his style at all, but um, I, yeah, I think we're, it's going to be quite easy for like Tara said, third down at the beginning. And I think he's going to show, that he's the guy. I think this is going to happen throughout the season. Um, he rose up my ranks. I had him almost like right there with Gibbs. Like I really like this running back. Um, yeah, I, I, that's that's all I have for him. I, I think this is a great, great, great spot for him, and I think he's going to be the man there sooner than we think. Yeah, there's a few running backs that maintained their value post draft compared to what we had coming in. I mean, there's some that lost a little bit of fizzle there, but I think Rashawn Johnson is one of those backs I had in my top. I think he was number five is where I had him ranked heading into the draft. I think he was able to kind of stay there. One of the other backs that I had moving up was Tank Bigsby, thanks to yeah. his landing spot there in Jacksonville, just simply because Travis Etienne is there. And then after that, there's not a whole lot there unless you're a big Jermichael Hasty fan. But for me, I'm looking at these biggest losers. I'm looking at another team that added running backs along the way. And this one hurts because I'm a big-time Kenneth Walker fan. Yeah. I love everything that Kenneth Walker can do. And he was basically sitting pretty atop that Seahawks depth chart. No real comp, no real competition there. A promising 20, a promising, promising 2023 fantasy season on the horizon. And then the Seahawks, they got cute. And I'll say this: the Seahawks moves and made it better. We talked about Smith and Jig, but he's there. That's great. But then they went out there and the value just slid to them with Zach Charbonnet. Zach Charbonnet is that north and south type runner that feeds on play action. And if they get that play action game going, Zach Charbonnet is going to be absolutely dead. He's going to, he's going to be a problem for Kenneth Walker. And then they go off there and they draft another pass catching running back in Kenny McIntosh out of Georgia, which is another thing that Kenneth Walker typically doesn't do is catch passes. So now you're going to have, we talk about Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, and that Smith and Jigba whole situation there and how those touches are going to go in. Kenneth Walker had 255 touches, so he's going to lose some of those touches probably to Smith and Jigba. That's going to happen. And mm -hmm. then he's going to lose some touches to Zach Charbonnet, and then he's going to lose some of those touches to Kenny McIntosh, who's going to come in on third down from time to time because that's what he what his strength is. Geno Smith, he asked for support. He's got a, one of the top trio of wide receivers in the entire National Football League. And now you look at what they did here in the backfield, and you're like, okay, this is not – something that you want to see. And when you look at their college production, Walker, he has a slight advantage over Charbonnet in his 4.27 yards after contact per attempt. But Charbonnet was no slouch at 3.54. So you look at all that stuff. But the biggest difference is when you look at Charbonnet, Charbonnet can actually catch the ball out of the backfield. He was asked to do this at UCLA. He was asked to do this at Michigan. Kenneth Walker was not asked to do this when he was at Wake Forest. He wasn't asked to do this at Michigan State. And we know McIntosh can catch the ball out of the backfield as well. So now you've got Kenneth Walker almost being put into a box of a first and second down type running back. That is not where you want a top 12 running back to be in fantasy. I, I think a lot of people had Kenneth Walker ahead of guys. Like I'll say it, they had him ahead of Josh Jacobs again. Shame on you. Never put these guys ahead of Josh Jacobs. Put some respect on Josh Jacobs' name. <laughs> Kenneth Raider Walker fan. is going to be struggling, I think, to be a top 15 back this season. And this is not, again, this is not a knock on his talent. Much like Smith and Jigba, it's because there's too many balls, catchers, carriers, whatever you want to call it, there's not enough balls to go around for Kenneth Walker to have success. There's no way he's going to get his 255 to 275 touches this season, which is going to hamper him in fantasy. And that is why he's one of my biggest losers going in. Now, Major, you watched Zach Charbonnet. I know he's one of your favorite running backs in this year's draft class. How, about, how much did this hurt you seeing Charbonnet going to Seattle and what it does for Kenneth Walker? Yeah, I, I mean, I – I honestly didn't really like Seattle's draft. Although they got star players, I think they could have spent that capital on the defense that, you know, they need some help over there. But, hey, I think if Walker wouldn't have gotten hurt, I think this was that pick would never happen. I think they was hoping he would be that three down back for them and all that stuff. But he got hurt, 
And I think that kind of scared the organization a little bit. Um, and, and then Zach fell right in their lap and, you know, he's, the dude runs hard. Like I, his style is hard. I can't explain it. He's not the fastest. He's not like the prettiest, but he's going to run the ball extremely hard. And I think and he's kind of smooth with it as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm with him on that, but, uh, is Kenneth Walker, have we heard, is he like fully, is he back all the way 100% now? Okay. Yeah, so I, I think it's because he got hurt, the only reason they made that pick. So um, I don't know, man. I think it'll be good. Uh, and like I said, Pete Carroll loves to run the ball, so he's going to, there's going to be enough um, carries in that backfield for both running backs to be successful, I think. Pete Carroll don't care where you were drafted. He, he's the guy who drafted Rashad Penny in the first round and stuck with Chris Carson there. So right. we'll see how that shakes yeah. out. Tara, where are you ranking Kenneth Walker heading into 2023 right now in your drafts? Where are you feeling comfortable mm. selecting him? RB2? Is he down to an RB2? Man, I don't have my rankings in front of me, Matt. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> he dropped back and forth. No, I, I really do want to absolutely pull up um, 100% just to verify. But um, it, it's a tough one because I think heading into this Yeah, season, no, he's a, he's a high-end. Yeah, he's a high-end RB. That was the most significant change. Um, that one was painful for me. Uh, and, I, and I will say, Seattle, the way that they drafted, they're 100% responsible for sending this draft sideways. Them taking Witherspoon, they sniped Detroit, who we all know was going to make that move. That's why right. Detroit traded back because that happened. That caused them to trade back. Then they got Gibbs. Um, and I'm convinced as well, them taking Charbonnet, which again, they were clearly drafted. Like, I, in my opinion, the way that they were doing it, and this is not, not to say that they were wrong to do it, but you could see um, they were going best available on their draft board. There was right. not a, we need this. Like, <laughs> we desperately need this. They were going best available. And hey, that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's certainly a strategy. Uh, they just, I, you know, <laughs> them taking Charbonnet, I am convinced like that might have been the breaking point for like a team like, um, like we wanted to see him go to somewhere like Cincinnati. Like maybe a Cincinnati might have said, hey, let's go ahead if Sharps had like, you know, been at a proper position for them. But I feel like Seattle just kind of sent a whole bunch of stuff sideways, unfortunately. Um, yeah, this one is tough for Kenneth Walker. And painful from a dynasty perspective. Let me say, I have a Josh Jacobs, Kenneth Walker team, and I was so arrogant, like it, like in, <laughs> in Ramondre Stevenson, so arrogant <laughs> that, like, uh, you know, I'm just so rich at running back, and now I'm like half broke, and that doesn't feel good. So Kenneth oh, Walker, oh, you know, truth is, we're we're in shambles, but we'll have to see how this plays out. But yeah, like Major said, I don't think there's a lot of loyalty here um, in terms of you know. Kenneth Wall, it's just this is really going to be a tough one that we're going to have to pay attention to and hope for the best here. Yeah. And with that said, let's talk about. I'm just going to kind of run down a list of here some more losers here before we move on to talk about better things here. And for me, Will Levis is always going to be a loser because it's Will Levis. I'm just going to go with that. Man, now I think he's going to land himself in a good position here. I think Tannehill is going to move on. Malik Willis is probably going to get cut here in the next little while. So I think things may shake themselves free there for Will Levis. But he's a loser because he basically lost about $25 million because of the way his <laughs> slide went down. Uh, a couple more. Raheem Mostert there. Jeffrey Wilson. Hello, Devin Achane or Achain or whatever you want to call him. Hey, don't matter. Hey, I want to call him the wrong thing each and every time because that kid is explosive. <laughs> and on that track team there in Miami, look out. <clears throat> Tyler Algier, and yes, Kyle Pitts is still a loser. I'm going to say this right now. Yeah. Why is Kyle Pitts still a loser? Because Arthur Smith is still going to run the ball. And now that he's got Beej and Robinson, he has no need to pass the ball ever. <laughs> he never <laughs> passed the ball before. Now all of a sudden he gets a guy like Beej and Robinson. He's going to run. Beej and Robinson is going to end up with like 450 touches it's next. Play uh, action. Here. Play <laughs> action to the tight end is going to be beautiful for them. Yeah, because it'll be like some other guy. It'll be like Felipe Franks catching all the passes <laughs> from the Falcons at the tight end position. I give that to you. Rashad Penny, Matt, I had this guy as a thousand yard rusher this season. I really thought he was going to stay healthy. When I say stay healthy, I, I mean 12 well. games. I was going to say he's going to play 12 games this season, and he doesn't give him a thousand yards. Now, the whole DeAndre Swift thing, it, it really messes with me, and I don't like it. I really don't. So, Penny is a loser just because of that. 
Matthew Stafford, another loser. No help support there. Puka Naku is the only piece on that offense they really had, unless you want to call Zach Evans as the RB2 in Los Angeles as help. And then Jared Goff, hey, we love Jared Goff on this show because he gets the fantasy points for us. But Hendon Hooker, even though he's like three years younger, it's going to be a problem here in a couple of years. And then, of course, another fan favorite of the show, KJ Osborne, you're a loser too because Jordan Addison is coming in there and he is going to win the rookie of the year this season for the Minnesota Vikings. Yes, he is going to put up some statistics. Okay, okay, I get it. He's not going to win rookie of the year because he's going to go to Bryce Young or CJ Stroll or one of these quarterbacks. Oh, Jack, the no moonwalk now, dude. Now. It's All these things are off. These are all quarterback awards. But I, I'll tell you right now, <laughs> Addison is going to be the best rookie Tara's wide receiver favorite, in this year's draft class. Tara, what do you got? I agree with that. I agree with that. Um, can I just say, <laughs> you saying that Penny was going to have 12 games is possibly the boldest thing, the boldest prediction. <laughs> that you have ever made on this show. You know this man hasn't made it through more than a third of the season, like his whole career. I know, I know. A third. New place, (laughs) new beginnings, Tara. You don't understand. Mm. New place, new beginnings. Stop being disrespectful. Maybe maybe the Seattle Doctors are worse than the Detroit Doctors. You think of that? You think of that? Maybe maybe they're worse in Seattle. I don't know. Yeah, they did, you know, fantastic with Swift and his like shoulder, ankle, foot, side, ha- hamstring injuries. Oh, knees and toes, knees and toes. Well, at least, <laughs> at least they didn't hurt, put a needle like... into his lung, right? Let's let's go be happy they didn't still play for the Chargers there. There's, there's still time. <laughs> <laughs>